And now it is time to get into our topic of the show with our very special guest, Kevin Lima. Welcome back to the Movie Podcast. We are super excited to introduce you to our special guest this week. He's worked on tons of your favorite Disney movies, including directing a Goofy movie, which just celebrated its 25th anniversary, Tarzan, Enchanted. Please welcome to the show, Kevin Lima. Kevin, hey thank you so much for joining us. You're very, very welcome. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So, Kevin, how before we get into any of our questions or anything, how are you doing? How are you kind of holding up and staying sane during everything happening in the world? Actually, it's kind of business as usual for me, to be quite honest with you. Okay, I, uh, very cool. Yeah, I do a lot of work from home. Um, so I'm constantly in, I have a studio at home, so I work in my studio. And, um, you know, writers are writing and people are developing work. So that's all, that's all good for me. That's awesome. Uh, have you have you found a big difference, I guess, with communicating with people mostly like through web chats and everything like that now? Or it's actually made it a bit easier, to be quite honest with you. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it puts us all in the same place. And we had been, um, I had been using sort of uh, all this sort of conference, uh, you know, online conferencing for a while. So it's so it's not really new. It's the rest of the world that's catching up. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So again, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We know you're busy working on a lot of stuff. As you said, it's business as usual for you. Uh, but we just really appreciate you joining us for uh, for this time today. Let's get into it. Um, yeah, so if, you, if you're able to um, just to tell us a little bit about the time that you're working. So obviously we, we mentioned that you're working on a goofy movie and you worked on Tarzan and enchanted. Um, yeah. Are you able to tell us a little bit about that time period, especially around a goofy movie uh, in the nineties? Sure. Um, I had been working at Disney for, Oh, I don't know how many years at that point, uh, six or seven, eight years. And I had done a lot of different things. I had, um, I was a character designer and a little mermaid and I'm beauty and the beast and did some storyboards on Aladdin and kind of decided that I wanted to direct. I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable just sitting behind my desk constantly. So, um, I asked to direct, they said there was no room that they had planned out the next 15 years or something crazy like that. And so I left the studio to go in, um, pursue a directing career. And about a year later, I started, I did a little bit of freelance um, on what was a Goofy movie to begin with. I'm not sure it was called a Goofy movie, though. I think it was called the Goof Troop movie. Oh, and uh -huh. um, Yeah. And I, uh, I did a little bit of freelance. I did some storyboards of Max waking up in the morning. And the, the guy who was leading up the development decided not to direct it. So they came knocking, and uh, I took on the gig. So that's how I that's how I got my first animation directing uh, gig was by uh, was by pursuing, going out and pursuing, um, you know, being a director. Oh wow! Did you feel like did you feel like the pressure of directing? Like, what, what was it a huge challenge taking that on directing for the first time? Um. It was a challenge, but it wasn't any different than what I had always done in some ways. I was, through my teenage years into my college years, I was a puppeteer. And, oh, as, wow. a, and as a puppeteer, I built puppets. I wrote shows. I was with a professional group in Rhode Island. And um, I directed a couple of puppet shows there. So I kind of had an idea of what it was like to work with a company. I was involved in theater. I had, before a Goofy movie, I had directed a community theater version of Into the Woods and A Christmas Carol. So I knew what it was like to work with, um, work with actors, to be an actor, in a sense. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't that challenging. Well, that's great. Kevin, um, I, I hate to say this, but you gave me such nightmares with that opening sequence of a Goofy movie. Were you, were you afraid you were going to turn into Goofy or that you were going to turn I into just, your dad? As you know, what it was a little bit of both. As a child, I was like, "Oh my God, why would someone animate this?" But it really, <laughs> it it really kind of helped me understand that you weren't afraid to take these kind of challenges with making darker themes. And especially when I was watching Tarzan as a kid as well, um, like the ending with Clayton's death and just you know Tarzan's parents dying, all these darker themes and jokes that you kind of put in your films. Did you ever get any pushback from Disney about that? Um, 
No, not really. I think that, um, you know, you can't have the joy without the darkness. And sometimes, you know, the darker, the darker the situations the characters get them into, I mean, just look at the Lion King, um, the greater the joy at the end of the movie. So I think it was sort of, uh, you know, we always felt that that was something that, uh, that we needed in order to get some uh, deeper emotional resonance um, in our storytelling. Did you ever feel uh, any competition between any other any other of the Disney films at that time? Because you know, like looking at the '90s, like you know, Pixar was coming into play. You had like you're coming off of The Lion King and other beloved movies as well, too. Did you ever feel any competition between any other films? Not not straightforward competition, um, and not from the artists. You have to remember that a Goofy movie was made by the Disney Toon Division, which was a you know, which was part of the, 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 the television animation division. Mm. And we were making movies, we were making movies for, I think a goofy movie cost $18 million. Oh, wow. Compared wow. Compared to the above a hundred million dollars that, uh, that the Lion King cost at the time. So, wow. so we kind of flew under the radar. What, what really became a problem, what I noticed on the back end, once we were done, is that the studio wasn't necessarily willing to support our film in the same way that they would support the Lion King. So they mm. didn't give us much of a marketing um, budget or push. And, you know, I think ultimately the, uh, the box office shows that the initial box office shows that they didn't stand behind the movie. That was the only time I really felt like, okay, there's something going on here at the studio that I don't quite understand. Feature animation doesn't want this, this little upstart movie to, to get any, um, you know, get any traction. So behind the scenes, I think, and I'm only guessing really, to be quite honest with you, that, that there were a lot of things that happened. Got you. Now, going from the Goofy movie to Tarzan, what were some of the biggest differences between uh, the creation of those, those two movies? Well, first of all, I got to sleep in my bed every night. Because <laughs> um, on a Goofy movie, we went to, um, we were all over the world, honestly, making that movie. Started in Burbank. I moved to Paris for a year and we animated most of the movie there. There was production in Spain, in Toronto, in oh, Australia. Wow. So we were working all over the world on that. On Tarzan, it was like a home base, right? So Disney feature animation, it all takes place in Burbank. Soup to nuts. So, um, so I didn't have that kind of a challenge. I think what was hardest probably for me making the transition was that on a Goofy movie, I was a single director. So I, I had some command in a way. Um, and not that it was hard because I, I made Tarzan with one of my best friends in the whole, whole world, Chris Buck. But that community at Disney Feature Animation, um, it pushes at directors in a different way. So everybody wants to be a director at Feature Animation. And so everybody wanted the movie to be the way that they wanted it. So you're constantly pushing up against, you know, 150 visions of what the movie should be. And holding on to your vision in that kind of an environment can be difficult, can be really hard. That was actually going to be my uh, segue to my next question, which was, how was it like uh, working with another director on Tarzan with Chris Buck? Like, what are some of the, I always wanted to know, like, when you have two directors making a movie, like what are your biggest challenges? Um, where do you go from there? Well, it wasn't that hard with Chris because he and I were, were like I said, very close friends to begin with. And I knew that Chris and I shared a, a, a like sensibility. So I didn't think it was going to be a problem creatively. And it wasn't. Um, one of the reasons I think that there are two directors at Disney Feature Animation, at least this is what they told me, was that it is impossible for a single director to get through a day with the number of people who are pulling at you and need your support. So, in fact, you divide up a lot of the, the, um, the duties. You don't, you don't divide up the vision. You try to share the vision. And we were, I think we were pretty good at doing that. Um, so we together spent all of our time in every story meeting. So with the story department, we were both there. And then we would split up day-to-day -day duties. 
So I went into um, the layout of the film. Chris went into animation and cleanup. And then we both shared all the back end duties. So it wasn't that I didn't get to be involved in any of that. Or Chris wasn't involved in what I did because we were constantly looking at each other's stuff and asking each other advice. But the day to day, you know, sitting down with those specific artists was, uh, you know, was put on each of us separately. Right. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Definitely. Yeah, that's awesome. One more question. And I always, always ask, I want to, I always want to know, how did you get Phil Collins to do the theme song? <laughs> like, how you know what? That, we asked him that story. You just it was him, as simple said, yeah. as asking him. Wow. It's really? That, eh? uh, yeah. We, um, we went through a couple of different iterations, figuring out what we wanted to do with the music. Um, I couldn't imagine having a break into song musical, to be quite honest with you. Right. Um, it was hard for me to imagine a half naked or a almost fully naked man on a tree branch <laughs> breaking into an I want song. It just didn't make sense to me. And I know I've got some criticism online for this, to be quite honest with you. There's one guy who just dug into Tarzan because it wasn't a break into song musical. <laughs> um, but I just couldn't imagine that, that marriage, to be quite honest with you. And we tried right. it. We tried it with the humans at the very beginning. We said, well, maybe the humans could sing. And it just felt awkward. Um, so we decided to take another route. And that was to allow the songs to become the internal voice of the character. Mm -hmm. So we started looking for pop artists and we, we talked about, we talked about a bunch of different people and because Phil was a drummer first and foremost, and we wanted drums to be the heartbeat of our movie, we approached him. So Chris and I went to Geneva. He was in, in Geneva at the time. We sat down with him. We talked to him about, about the movie. He was a little, I think trepidatious at first. Um, but I'll tell you, once he grabbed a hold of it, he was, you know, he was on fire on this movie. We would, we'd bring up an idea for a song. And honestly, the next time, you know, the next day, he'd send us this set of lyrics that he'd written out on a napkin. Wow. Um, wow. Really, that's how he wrote You'll Be In My Heart. He just wow. he started tapping it out for us on, a, um, on the rail at the studio. And he just started singing it for us a cappella. And we were like, okay, this guy, this guy has it. He understands yeah. the. He understands this movie in, in a deep way. So, did you guys uh, did you guys find yourself writing around his music, or was it kind of like a a nice collaboration where it just kind of felt natural what he was writing and it fit what you guys were writing? No, at every single turn, we asked for a song. We said we believe <laughs> there should be a song here. We think this song should be about this. We'd write a scene that that gave you the arc of a song, and we give that to him. Um, at the very beginning, he sent us a, a tape of like five different musical themes. Didn't have any lyrics at all. So um, we'd say, we want a song here where Tarzan grows up and he becomes a man. And then he writes, Son of Man. Um, it was like that at every single solitary turn. We'd ask for something, he'd go away and grab a hold of it and uh, you know pull it together. That's amazing. That's awesome. wicked. Now... Um a year after Tarzan came out, I mean, the world got introduced to an extremely goofy movie. Would you have any involvement with that, Kevin? Or was that just purely like a whole other team and you kind of gave them your blessings and kind of went your way? I had zero involvement. Um, and in fact, I wish I had had more involvement because there are a, a couple of things that I think they really missed out on. One of them being Roxanne. She's I not agree. Really goofy. Oh, my 100%. God. 100%. 100 <laughs> percent it feels like a and tale of two that. different films it is it is it's two different groups of people um you know all the specifics are are pretty much changed he has a couple you know he still hangs out with bobby and pj yeah Ruby has a totally different job um yes so and it brings up a lot of questions about well what happened to this character and how about that character it's still very funny i think it's a funny mm -hmm. movie mm -hmm. um but but it doesn't feel like a continuation of, of the film. It doesn't feel like it embraces everything that was wonderful about the first movie. Exactly. Right. And the way you wrote Max's character and the, the character arc of that seems to have totally have been erased by the time we get to a Goofy movie. So that's why I was like, huh, this is kind of confusing. But, I mean, I just want to give my love again to the Goofy movie, a Goofy movie because it's phenomenal writing and phenomenal direction. Oh, thank you very much. 
We worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, go jumping off Shay's point there about like the love that Goofy movie's getting. You know, like we have Disney Plus now that's opening the doors to so many people and to so many new viewers of a Goofy movie, which is getting so much love. And I think what when we were you and I, Kevin, when we were initially uh, talking to one another, we I was I mentioned that Twitter thread that you're doing about the live watch and i just right. want to know what's it means what's it meant to you seeing the love that this movie is getting now 25 years after its release it's uh it's kind of shocking to me to be quite honest with you because <laughs> i originally when i took on the movie i took it on as okay this is my chance to direct right i get to be i'm giving an opportunity with this movie um not going to change the world May not even be loved, but it's given me it's given me a break. It has turned into for, for, first of all, when we made it, I absolutely committed myself, you know, a hundred, two hundred percent to making this movie as good as it could be. And you know, I brought a lot of emotion to it. I brought a lot of what I thought was missing in animation, which was telling a contemporary story, something that set felt like it was set today, or I guess in nineteen ninety five. Um, and I really worked hard to make sort of a contemporary John Hughes movie in a way, right? Of course. Said, why can't, why can't animation do that too? So all these years later, it comes out, it's not a big success theatrically. It kind of gets, it kind of disappears. And then about, say maybe, maybe six, seven years ago, I noticed that there was all this love starting to happen. It was happening online. I was doing auditions for another movie, which had a young guy in it. And when they found out I directed Goofy movie, they would start quoting the movie back to me. Like, like <laughs> big actors, like big actors in coming into the room. And they were like, do, you know, you know, quoting Bobby and stuff. And I was scratching my head saying like, what's going on here? And, and then slowly over time, I realized that this movie had connected with a whole generation of, of kids, mostly guys, I have to say, but there's a lot of love from, from the female population as well. And um, we did, we did this thing at D23, I think maybe three years ago, three or four years ago. And they put it in a small hall. It was a little like retrospective of, of a goofy movie. Kevin Campbell showed up and sang eye to eye at the end of it. I think you can watch it <laughs> oh my online. Goodness. You can watch it online. Um, and they put it in a, like a 400 seat theater and they turned away as many people. They turned wow. away about 600 people who wanted to be at this thing. And that's the point really where Disney realized, okay, we've got something here. And that's when you started to see some merchandise show up. Um, I was so thrilled to see a, to see a, a Funko pop figure of, of, of power line. Yes. Like, oh, I was over the moon to see that. Um, and I realized that it's part of a culture, a, you know, a sort of a sort of a cult culture that's grown into this big explosion that we're seeing today. Um, and honestly, it's it's my most popular movie as far as people being outspoken about how much they love it. That's um, amazing. And it's amazing for me. It's amazing for me to see that something because I put a lot into this movie. I, you know, I had my father took off when I was. 12 years old and I didn't see him for 25 years. I didn't see him till Tarzan came out actually. Wow. So on some level, I think I was working out all of my issues with my dad, my non-existent dad when I was making a goofy movie. So mm -hmm. to see that something that I put something real of myself into the film and that it had ramifications or had, had, you know, I touched so many others was, was, is, is, is incredibly rewarding. You know, you can't ask for, for much more than that, than for something to speak to other people, something that's so personal to you, you know, and who would think that a goofy movie would be so personal to me, but it, but right. it, but it has really deep roots in who I am. Um, so, so it's overwhelming. It's overwhelmingly beautiful really to, to, to see it all happening at this point. That's amazing. Well, Kevin, I, I can say as a fan of the film that whenever I see any a goofy movie merchandise, whether it's typically it's only been at Disney parks, um, it's very heartwarming because to me, it's always felt like this, yes, the smaller film that I have like a small community with, but 
you know, the people that watch it, they love it. Um, so I, I have like power line pins and shirts and, you know, it, it's one of the great, it's, it's my greatest treasures that I have. Um, and we know people right with power line tattoos as well too. Which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had, you know, since I, since I did the little Twitter thing for the 25th anniversary, I was tweeting, I was live tweeting, not tweeting live. I was live tweeting. <laughs> um, and people have been sending me stuff like, Hey, look at my, look at my max from standout tattoo. And I was like, <laughs> you guys are putting that stuff on your body. <laughs> wow. wow it must have really meant something to you to grab a hold do of you, it that way do you have a favorite line from the movie because there's something about the delivery of stacy talk to me talk to me talk to me baby that i just love but do you have a favorite <laughs> line yourself oh man um boy i don't know uh boy i, I have to say that i love all my children equally um, <laughs> good answer you know the thing, the, the, the lines that come to mind immediately are like, like "Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, baby," or "Look, Max, it's the Leaning Tower of Cheesa." Yes. Or, you know, another one is "Beat it, doofus." Um, <laughs> so another one that comes to mind, or, or "How many cups of sugar does it take to get to the moon?" To the moon. Those are kind of the lines that just sort of grab me. Did uh, you guys know that I'm a voice in a goofy movie? Who did you no. voice? I am. Lester, I'm the walk around Lester. I'm like, who's your favorite possum? Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> what? I'm the uh, guy this... who's like, howdy, folks, and welcome to Lester's <laughs> Possum Bar. I'm that guy. That's oh, amazing. Wow. That's, That's absolutely amazing. amazing. We have two celebrities in this chat right now. Then. <laughs> now, Kevin, you transition from directing animated films to going to a live action film with Enchanted. Uh, with Amy Adams. Um, how was that transition going from an animated environment to a live action environment? Well, I'd actually made that transition seven years earlier with, um, I had, dire I directed 102 Dalmatians with Glenn Close. Yes. And oh, yes. Glenn yes, was yes. a, yeah, Glenn was a voice in Tarzan. She played Kala. Yeah. And, we, were, we were just, we were just discussing that too. Yeah. And when, um, and when I was recording her, she said to me, you know, you direct more like a live action director than like an animation director. You don't like, you're not just asking me to do five takes in a row different. You're actually working with me to make adjustments and find shades um, of delivery. Have you ever thought about doing a live action movie? And I said, immediately, just said, yes, I'd love to do that. I really would. Well, you know, a couple of years later, Glenn Close, they lose their director on 102 Dalmatians, and she actually is responsible for this. She said, what about Kevin? Wow. Oh, wow. And I had also told the studio after Tarzan that I was going to go out and look for some live action, um, and, you know, um, you know, opportunities. So it all kind of worked out, and I slid right into that film. I'll tell you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Right. Because, because. There are so, much, so many things that are different, as I'm sure it is difficult for a live action director to slide into animation. I can't imagine that that's an easy transition either. Um, everything about the storytelling is exactly the same, but how you actually record the work, how you get to that final piece of film is, is very different. In animation, it's spread out over, over years sometimes to get a shot finished. In live action, everything moves to one moment in time where you record it with a camera. So, you know, you're, you're prepping, you're prepping, you're prepping. And in that hour, you're expected to get your final piece of footage. And, um, that's, that's hair raising. That's, you know, anxiety, anxiety ridden. So that was the big difference. And I had to learn how to work with a camera because in animation, we really didn't talk about things like, a 35 millimeter lens. Um, we talked about everything else. We talked about lighting. We talked about lighting direction. We talked about intensity. We talked about color. We talked about how to support character arcs um, with the art direction and costume. We, all that stuff is exactly the same. But getting to that moment and making sure in that 20 minutes that you've got exactly what you wanted is, is too, can be difficult. For sure. And on top of it, and on top of it, I was working with 102 dogs. In a parrot. <laughs> so, so you add that to it. I'm just not working with a group of actors. I'm trying to get performances from animals. 
which is hard. All I need to do is add a couple of babies, and I would have just, the top of my head <laughs> you, would have blown off. You would have hit the trifecta perfectly, you know, of your <laughs> first live-action film. And obviously, you also directed the Eloise movies, which are beloved movies of mine, and my family watches Eloise at Christmas every year. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, great. I, just so much love for that movie. I, and, you know, that was that was sort of the, the rebound from 100 Jude Dalmatians, to be quite honest with you. It was like, really? now I know a couple of things. Now I know enough. And let's go in to make these movies. Um, and working with Julie Andrews was a dream. Absolutely adore that woman. And, um, you know, I, I, I think we did okay. I actually, I actually won the DGA award for Eloise at Christmas time for best children's oh, wow. programming, which was cool. Um, yeah, of course. So I, so I really felt like I had learned something, which then led to Enchanted. You know, I know there's been like, there's a lot of love for Enchanted. Has there been any talks with you about ever revisiting that world or revisiting those characters? I, they, they are revisiting it. Right. They've been working on a, on a sequel now for 13 years. They've been working on a sequel. Wow. <laughs> um, and I, unfortunately, am not going to be involved in it. Got you. Yeah. So. So that's that's very sad for me. I wish I wish it, I wish I was a part of it. Of course, but circumstances being what they are, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, not involved. But you left them so, a hell of a, a shoes to fill, though. I will say that for sure. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But you know, I have to just I just keep looking forward. I just keep looking for what's next. What's what's the next thing? How can I tell a new story? What's the next new story to tell? Right. And uh, you know, I spent a long time. I spent the last I want to say probably. 13 years working on movies. None of them have gone into production yet, which have been kind of a drag, but we're just on the cusp of something with Netflix that we're really excited about. So that's all good. Um, but I developed a lot of movies and was involved in a lot of movies over the past uh, 13 years. It's a shame that none of them have, have made it. On Twitter, actually, I'm starting to release a couple of uh, images of um, from a movie that, got, that I was doing at DreamWorks that ended up not going into production when they sold the company. Was it the the Mumbai one, right? Yeah, Monkeys of Mumbai. Yeah, yeah. that would have—I tell you—that would have been a. The the art is amazing, and it would have been an amazing movie. But you know the circumstances of that moment in time when uh, when the studio was being sold to Universal sort of mm -hmm. led to, I think, about seven projects being closed down. Oh wow! Oh, wow. Yeah, including a project that was almost completely done, ready to be released. Oh my goodness! Wow. Yep. Oh, that's that's yep. heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. Now, Kevin, very, very oh my god. Now Kevin, with you yeah. with all of us really staying at home right now, uh what have you been watching? Like there's probably so many things in your catalog that you're probably going through right now. Um yeah. Yeah, I'm watching some some um watch a bunch of stuff, something every night. I'll tell you what I've been turning to is that uh I've been watching a lot of um comedy specials, strangely oh, wow. enough. Oh, that's good. Um Yeah, I don't I Maybe I just need a little lift at the end of the day. Yeah. But I watched, um, uh, what's his name? John Mulhoney. Watched his bunch of his stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Is that the right run? Oh, John Mulaney. 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 Yes. Mulaney. John Mulaney. Yeah. Was, He's great. For some reason, I say his, his name wrong every single time. <laughs> Mulaney. Mulaney. I watched his stuff. Really like that. Watched some Ricky Gervais. Watched, um, oh, what's his name? Bo. Bo, uh, Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham, yeah. Burnham. Very funny. Yeah, guy. I watched his stuff. I think he's hilarious. I love him. Um, got a chance to work with him a little bit at uh, on Monkeys in Mumbai, as a matter of fact. Oh wow! Oh. So, so yeah, so I've been watching that. I feel like most of the stuff that's on is pretty serious. So after I get <laughs> through unorthodox, <laughs> I have to watch something that lifts my spirits a little bit. Of course. <laughs> now, Kevin. We can't thank you enough for joining us on the episode today. Before we wrapped up, I just wanted to ask you, uh, if people wanted to follow your work, uh, would Twitter be the best place to do it? We'd love if you could just kind of plug your social media wherever people could follow you and maybe give us a little tease or if there's anything you can announce that you are working on that has been announced, we'd love to hear it as well. Okay. Well, let's see. Well, Twitter's really my first foray into social media, to be quite honest with you, and a goofy movie was responsible for that. And I'm at uh, Kevin Lima at Goofy Movie Dir, D I R. Gotcha. Um, so that's where I've been tweeting a bunch of stuff. And I've been having a great time doing that. And people seem really appreciative. So that's been fun. Um, yeah. As far as future projects, I've got like two things that are 
that are in development right now. Can't can't really tell you much about them, but one is that's that okay. And one is at the uh, um, the Disney Channel. We've got about five other things that we're going out with to to get to get jump started pitching to the studios. So that's all good. Um, I had a company actually with my wife called uh, Twas Entertainment, and. My wife, if you guys don't know, is Brenda Chapman, the director mm-hmm. of The Prince of Egypt and Brave. Yes. So for the first time ever, we decided to uh, actually go into business and try to make, uh, try to collaborate, something we've, we've never done. <laughs> How's that been so far, that journey, working together? Yeah, so far, it's just pretty good. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we've both matured enough to know that, uh, how to handle each other and you know, having two directors sometimes can be can be difficult because we each want our own way. Right. But um, but it makes it um, you know, it makes it good. And one of the other things that we did is this all started because Brenda and I wrote a script together. So um, we wrote something that we think uh, people would let us uh, produce, and it's about uh, uh, do you know the the um the the Greek myth the the Golden Touch, like Midas. Like Midas, the Midas touch, yeah. Golden Touch. Yes. So we, uh, so we took that that uh, that idea and wrote a script about someone who gets cursed with a cartoon touch. Oh. And you can figure out what that's about. I dig it. So, I really dig it. Yeah, it could be very, very cool. Yeah. So Kevin, again, thank you so much. We're going to put all of uh, you. We're going to put your Twitter in our show notes as well, too, so our listeners could, will be able to find you and follow you there. Again, okay. we're so appreciative of you joining us on the show today and taking out a, a chunk of your day to talk with us. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. You are, you are so welcome. Thank you for reaching out. It's fun. No worries. All right, Kevin, you, we want you to have a great day. Okay. Take All care, right. Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Kevin, again, for joining us on the show this week. Guys, that was, that was pretty cool. That was wicked. He's such a nice guy. He's such a nice guy. And again, open invite anytime you want to return Kevin. So thank you so much. And we can't wait to see what you work on next. 